This is Support is Sexy, episode 563, with Jess Osro, co-founder and COO of The Rise Journey. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. And today we are talking about, well, I won't say it's one of my favorite things, but it's something that I think we need to talk about even more, imposter syndrome. And we're talking about that with Jess Osro. And Jess does workshops and events where she talks about imposter syndrome, how to get over it, how real it is. And in this episode, she shares with us, well, one, three ways to get over imposter syndrome, but also some ways that the ego plays into that imposter syndrome and how humility can help minimize the ego. Go. She also talks about what you need to consider before you leave your job and why success isn't always about money. Or if it is, you need to be real about that. What does success mean to you? How do you define success? What's important to you in your business? She also talks about the importance of something that I love, staying open to the possibilities. But again, I really want you to listen out for the conversation around imposter syndrome. We all face it in different ways, so it's important to bring it to the forefront and just chat about it. All right, so I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. Without further ado, Jess Osro. So Jess, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. Hi, thank you for having me. So our first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Uh, I think I've always been better at being my own boss or working with others as a mutual boss rather than doing it, doing it under other supervision. Um, my parents and grandparents, you know, all treated me as a very independent creature. I was the youngest of all the, all the cousins and was very much in charge of all the cousins from day one. Um, and I think just doing my own thing and creating my own thing, you know, came really naturally. Um, you know, whenever I was under guidance of somebody else, I always felt like something was missing, which always led me to create my own thing, even if I was working a nine to five job. Uh, yeah. So I, I think in, you know, in terms of falling in love with entrepreneurship, it was definitely a slow roll um, and not really recognizing that it was entrepreneurship, even when it was. It was just part of your personality, it sounds like. Yeah, just to do it because I was never satisfied. I still am never satisfied with the status quo. And so many people seem to be. And I said, oh, OK, like, let's like, I'm going to do it on my own. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess like the most recent example of it is um, my business partner, who's also named Jessica. Um, we go to a ton of events in New York City, and the most recent was uh, the Blend NYC events, which are great. And we talk about diversity and take it really seriously. And I'm always, I always have a question within the first like 30 seconds. And my business partner is always like, Jess, like put your hand down. Like, it's, not, <laughs> it's not time for questions yet. You're like, I feel uh, my hand going up. I can't help oh, it. Yeah we need to sit on opposite sides of the room. It was really the answer. Um, And at the end of the event, it was like, these speakers are great. The moderator was, was brilliant, but there was never enough depth for me. There was never enough full response. Like it was clear they had more to say. And I turned to her and I said, you know, it's clear that the only way I'm going to get the answers I want is by asking the questions I want in the format I want to ask it. Um, And so I created, we're starting a new, I'm calling it a blog cast series, somewhat of a podcast, somewhat of a blog series mixed together, um, interviewing, you know, people who clearly are dedicated to diversity and inclusion and culture. And, you know, this kind of real talk that Jess and I want to perpetuate with our, with our business. Um, and so, I, you know, it started where I just, you know, created a Google form and I said, I would love to interview you, but also like, if you just want to fill out this form, totally get it, time constraints. Um, and I've just gotten the most amazing response, um, because it sounds like they're, they had the same issue I have. They just weren't able to verbalize it of not being able to give the detail and the level of interest they have in their specific more niche areas. Um, so I just wasn't happy with the status quo and said, screw it, I'm doing it my way. And uh, <laughs> just started that. So that's kind of the most recent example of. I love it. Now, what will this blog cast look like? It, will it be a blog? So written content, obviously you're asking people to fill out a form, but then are you going to do something like a podcast or air it, I should say, uh, what's the word? Uh, put it out there as a podcast when you do the interview. 
Not totally sure yet. I know we're going to definitely incorporate audio clips into the podcast because some of it is just, you know, hearing it straight from the horse's mouth kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition, and we haven't, we haven't totally figured out the audio. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my business partner loves podcasts. I listen to a couple, but like, just not my jam. Um, But I definitely want like the themes that have been coming up. You know, it's very clear there's reoccurring themes and how people, we really want it to be actionable. We're all about taking action. Like, Advice is great, but it means nothing if you can't do something about it and do something about it like today and tomorrow and the next day and have it grow. Um, So we really want to kind of format it of like, you know, person A is talking about this, um, you know, this theme within culture. Um, Here's how we would approach it as, you know, a consulting agency. Here's how we would want, you know, a small business to tackle it. And then, you know, how this person has handled it within their own business, within their own realms. Um, So not only do we give actionable advice, but we have, you know, how it's been put into place already by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now, before you became an entrepreneur and started working with your partner, Jessica, uh, your business partner, how did you, did you know that, um, or did you do anything else outside of entrepreneurship? So full-time position somewhere else or some other career before you hopped into this? Yeah, I've done everything (laughs) else Mm -hmm. outside of entrepreneurship. Um, My educational background is actually theater, art, and Spanish. Um, I come from a very liberal, artsy, hippy-dippy parents kind of background, um, which led me to take a lot of different directions because they were super open to encouraging me to do what felt right. And you grew Um, up in New York, right? So I grew up in New Hampshire. I grew up on dead dead end dirt roads, was trick-or-treating with my pet sheep, you know, as a a young kid. Um, And, you know, I always say like in New Hampshire, you really have to make your own trouble. It's very difficult to get into trouble because there just isn't any. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's how I approach, you know, work in life is, you know, you have to, you have to make it, you have to find it. Um, But that being said, you know, also have to pay the bills. Um, And when I first moved to New York, I had four jobs within my first week of moving to New York. I was working for one of the Real Housewives of New York. I was working as a pet sitter when people went on vacation. I I um, was working as a personal organizer, which pretty much meant going into people's basements and trying to make sense of it all, um, and nannying. And I was nannying for two world-famous artists that with their eight-year-old boy, um, and just picking up odd jobs wherever I can or in wherever I could. That led into working as an executive assistant to a nonprofit in, a, in the dance realm, which led to me being totally frustrated with nonprofit life and getting my first job in uh, startups. And I worked as an executive assistant to essentially the chief financial officer of a startup that's now defunct. Um, and that got, fell, you know, I fell in love with startups right away. Like my first day he was like, okay, here's a whole bunch of stuff, figure it out. And I was like, Oh, cool. Like I can do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that job led into a foray with HR via Google um, as our HR person was not and ended up helping grow the company for, I was number 19 when I left, there was over a hundred in the U S um, I helped hire over 200 people in India I started an intern program, which had over 125 interns over nine months. Um, and so it really allowed me, as frustrating as it, there was elements at the time, it really allowed me to expand my HR skills and my people ops skills. Um, and again, recognize that the status quo is not enough and what was happening was not okay in my eyes. And so I needed to make it better. Now, was HR an area of interest for you already or were you there as an executive assistant? And like you said, your, your boss or manager at the time was like, here's a bunch of stuff for you to do, figure it out. And you sort of fell into it and discovered that you liked it. Definitely the latter. Um, I, you know, within theater, I worked as a stage manager, which is essentially, you know, the sign of a good stage manager is you don't know they exist. Um, and I equate that a lot to HR as well. You know, if an HR, if an HR department and all that it, that it includes does a really great job, the people are happy, everything's functioning and moving well. Um, so it was a kind of a natural slide, but I was handed a whole bunch of stuff and said, I don't know how to do state tax documentation, figure it out. We need to figure out a new payroll system, figure it out. We don't have adequate healthcare, figure it out. Um, which was frustrating, but it also allowed me to learn on my own terms, which was really great. And so I, you know, did some, no, no formal classes, but I did a lot of e-learning. I was Googling. I was meeting with people, asking about what they were doing within their realms. Um, I started doing diversity and inclusion initiatives without actually recognizing, because I didn't have the education and the terminology to use at that point. Um, but that allowed me to go. My next tech startup job, I was an HR generalist, and I picked up enough knowledge um, and took to it pretty naturally. I like people. I like talking with people. Um, I'm, you know, I very easily build relationships with people. So HR was a really natural place for me to feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up becoming the chief operating officer of the Rise journey? Tell us Uh, about that journey for you. Honestly, it it was completely born out of frustration, um, which again, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurship is. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I was working at a company called Hired, which is a great company. Um, they help software engineers get jobs they love. And I was working um, as a career coach with engineers there and really wanted to move into diversity and inclusion. Um, I have a very large tech network in New York and women in business and, you know, diversity and inclusion in tech in New York and, um, you know, have participated on panels and, you know, talk a lot about disability in, in business and was just like really embedded in it in my personal life and trying to transition that into my my career life. Um, and so we were offered a, an education stipend at Hired. And so I took this class thinking I was going to get the, the payment back. It turns out I didn't because it didn't qualify enough for my job, which was frustrating. <laughs> Frustration number one. Um, but I, I took a master class at New York University, um, managing diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And it was a super small class and it was just completely and utterly brilliant. Um, it was all the things that I wanted to talk about in all the scenarios and the hard conversations and the questions that like, you know, as my, you know, I'm a middle-class privileged white female. Um, and so there's conversations that I don't feel comfortable starting, but I want to be a part of. And uh, that the class has allowed me to, you know, it was actually a multiple master class, um, you know, take these conversations that I was like dying to have, but n- not sure how to have them, not sure how to approach them. Now I feel much more comfortable starting them on my own, um, you know, acknowledging myself. And it was just like, the classes were just magical. Like I, I would take, I would have taken the class, you know, the classes over and over again. Um, my professors were just really incredible, talented individuals within the diversity and inclusion realm in all different areas of walks of life and business. Um, but my business partner, Jessica, was also in that class. Um, there's always another Jess and, you know, Jessica's like the most popular name <laughs> on the planet. And so- right. There's always another Jess in life. I know uh, a few is, great Jessicas, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you know, you know it was quite, I was like, of course, in a class of like eight people, there's another Jess. But um, Jess and I were the only two who really couldn't shut up about anything. We just constantly had more questions and we wanted to know more. And, you know, we would be the ones staying after class to talk to the professor. And, you know, on our, there was a lot of online learning and our, like on chat rooms and boards and whatnot. And we were constantly going back and bringing in new resources and starting up new conversations that, you know, by the end of the tangent, you know, like six degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of connected, but ultimately we just couldn't stop having these conversations. Um, so, you know, whenever we met in person or had class, we just, we just connected and clicked and we would end up talking after class and talking about the lack of satisfaction with the status quo around culture, around diversity and inclusion, around the conversations people are having with it because people are so afraid and neither one of us are, are afraid to talk. <laughs> we talk very differently. We have very different styles. We, we, atta- we tackle topics in very different ways, but neither of us are afraid to have conversations and talk and connect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really drawn to her and she had taken the class knowing she wanted to start something and she wasn't sure what that something was, uh, but she was a serial entrepreneur um, and knew she wanted to start something around culture and business because there was a gap and, but she couldn't quite define it. Um, and my background within startups and HR and being in this, I could see the gap, but didn't want to start my own thing again. I have my own consulting business around coaching and didn't want to do something on my own again. And so we kind of came together and chatted about it. And I was very uneasy. I I was on the precipice of leaving hired though. I didn't know it at the time and was, you know, trying to figure out life and what I really wanted to do next. And we just kept having conversations. And then one day I was a co-founder of the rise journey and COO and, here I am today. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that part of the journey too, because I just wanted people to hear, uh, well, one, your story and how it worked for you, but also sometimes, most times, I don't know about what you think, most times you don't know exactly how it's going to work out or exactly what it is that you're looking for. I feel like, you know, there's moments of certainty, or at least this has been my experience, moments of certainty, but then there are definitely moments where I'm sort of feeling my way and waiting for the right thing or keeping, keep moving, waiting for the right thing to sort of meet me along the way. You know, like it's not necessarily, this is clear, this is who I'm supposed to partner with, et cetera. So just for people to hear, you kept having conversations. You were in a space where you seemed open to the possibilities. It sounds like she was also open, but not really sure. And it just worked out. Yeah. And that's exactly, you know, if you had told me even a year ago that this is where I would be, I would have laughed at you. Like, you know, I was hired was great in a lot of ways. It was also very cushy. It was very, you know, easy and light and fun. And I was making enough of an impact in a lot of ways and, you know, in a certain, you know, rose tinted glasses, it was great. Um, 
you know, and if you would have told me I was going to leave a high paying job to start something new and, you know, right now I've been without a full time, without any salary aside from a couple of side gigs for almost a year. Mm -hmm. And if you had told me that and I would have looked at my bank account and said, you you know, no way in hell would I ever do that. Um, and by far, this is the brokest I've been in a long, long time and by far the happiest I've been. Um, mm. And it took a lot of being very open and just saying, okay, you know, I feel good with this. This feels like a good choice right now in this moment. You know, I'm going to go with it and I'm still going to pursue all the other potential open doors at the same time. I'm not going to isolate myself and say, this is the only thing I can work on. Um, and I'm, you know, very fortunate. Jess and I, you know, support each other in a lot of ways. And she has a, a part-time gig that she works and, she supports me in, you know, whatever endeavors I need to do to also, you know, pay the bills while getting a business up and running. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really about being open and, you know, accepting of all the potential open doors or open windows or crack doors or anything you can get your exactly. foot in. Exactly. Glimmer of lights <laughs> anywhere. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So what was it then that, um, and thank you so much for being so honest about that. Like you said, this is the broke, I wrote this down as a quote, <laughs> this is the brokest I've been and the happiest I've been. And for a lot of us, that's not necessarily an easy choice. Um, even if you didn't know that it was going to be the brokest at the time or just, you know, the struggle that might have been there. But what at what point, or I shouldn't say at what point, how did you make the decision to leave that cushy, comfortable, you know, high paying job and uh, go for something like this? Even the fact that it was new is still a quote unquote risk. What, yeah. were, the, what were the conversations, if any, it might have been you just knew this was the right thing that you had to have with yourself to get yourself in a position to say, OK, I'm going for it. Yeah, I think the number one thing that is always on the top of my mind, but people don't talk about is the financial piece. Um, I am a great saver. I am really, really good with money, um, which I don't think a lot of people can say. Mm -hmm. um, I w my mom taught me very early, you know, I used to get an allowance when I was little and I would get a dollar and 50% of it had to go into big savings. 25% of it had to go into small savings and 25% I was allowed to spend. So, you know, with a dollar, it's a real, you know, easy math. 50 cents goes to big savings, 25 cents goes to small savings. And I would go down to the pharmacy and I would get myself a push-up pop for 25 cents. Um, but starting that at the age of five, I really recognized the value of savings and what it did. Um, and I had some great math teachers along the way that re really reinforced the financial security piece. Mm -hmm. um, so before even thinking about leaving hired, I looked at my, you know, savings account. I looked at my monthly bills and I said, you know, I won't leave until I have six months in the bank. I want to be able to pay my full rent. Even if my roommates didn't pay rent, I wanted to be able to be covered. I wanted to have Cobra. I'm on Cobra health insurance, have that covered. Um, you know, food bill, I estimated, you know, if I'm spending $500 a month on miscellaneous expenses around food and apartment and whatnot, I needed to have that in the bank. And so I was comfortable financially, um, mm -hmm. which I feel like a lot of people get nervous about. And, you know, I, I say to everybody like, you know, quit your job, but check your bank account first because there is an aspect. And if you're not there, like work your ass off, save every penny you can for X period of time until you're at that financial point where you can quit mm -hmm. if you're wanting to do that anyway. Um, so I think that's a big thing, especially for women. Um, don't take that into account enough. And then it becomes a scary thing. And then all of a sudden you're like, crap, I have no money in the bank and I need to find another scramble full-time job to be unhappy again. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of thing one as I was looking at that. Um, the other thing is I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I couldn't leave and go to another job. Um, I had started applying for some jobs and then nothing felt right. Nothing. I didn't like the act of applying for a job was exhausting. Um, you know, and as a career coach, like I know what I need to do. I know what steps I need to take. I know what I need to fix. I know what within my branding needs to change or grow or whatnot for a new job. And I just couldn't pull myself to do that. Um, so I also had to get comfortable with the fact of leaving and not knowing and being okay, really okay with the not knowing, um, except for that health insurance piece. I knew I needed to have health insurance. Um, and then it got to a point at hired where between the people I was working with and my manager no longer felt like I, I didn't feel like I was learning anything from my manager anymore. Um, I didn't feel like I was making an impact, which was really the biggest thing. Um, and it felt like I was showing up just to show up. And once you get to that point, once anybody gets to that point, people around, you know, you can't hide that as much as you want to say, oh, I'm good at hiding the fact that I don't care anymore. Right. That I don't you, really want to be here. You can't, you know, and somebody's going to notice or some multiple people are going to notice. And that's what it got to is it was like, this is no longer the right place. Um, and I left. 
Um, mm -hmm. and it happened really fast <laughs> from like, one week from a conversation with my boss, I was, I was out, which we felt really rushed and really scary in that first week. Like I remember I came home and actually my cousin and one of her friends was staying with me from out of town and I came home and I, you know, I was sitting on the couch when they got in and I was like, I quit my job today. <laughs> and they were like, uh, I think we should sit down and talk. Um, and it was both like an exhaustion, but also such a relief. And I think for about a week, I felt incredibly tired. And then the next week I was like, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. um, which was both completely fearful, like, holy crap, I can do anything, but also totally exhilarating. Um, and I took a lot of time off. And like I said, I've been without a paycheck since the end of October of 2017. Um, and I've spent wisely and I, you know, have a couple of contract gigs, but man, it's definitely a crazy ride to think that a year ago I was working in the, where I was, like how much, how far I've gone in, in a year, in a year. Have you learned a lot about yourself in that time, in this time, in this past year? I think I've solidified the things I thought I knew. Hmm. Um, that's one example. Yeah, I the fact that I do need to not necessarily be my own boss because, you know, my business partner and I share that responsibility, but that I truly do respond better when I have ownership of everything I'm doing, including my mistakes, including my missteps. Um, it's much easier for me to say, wow, you know, I, I screwed the pooch on that one um, rather than have to cover or there being other possibilities um, I would rather take the ownership of the win along with the ownership of the loss right. rather than just the ownership of the win. Yeah. You like that the quote unquote buck stops with you kind of thing. Yeah. And I really, I, you know, I, and I am, I have learned, it has been a long learning process because it does not come naturally to the women in my family, let alone anybody in my family to take the fall, to take the blame, to apologize and to admit mistakes um, and I found so much power in admitting my mistakes. Um, and I've always been very self-aware in my personal life and my, you know, family life. Um, and, I've, you know, taken a point of pride. I've been in and out of therapy since I was four years old and thank God for therapists. Um, truly glorious mental health is something that nobody, nobody talks about enough in depth. And I'm all about, you know, talking about mental health, but, um, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the full ownership of the entire, you know, vertical or horizontal whatever it comes in um, has been really powerful. And that ownership has allowed me to take bigger risks because I know I can take, I can, I can apologize bigger. I can, I can apologize on a larger scale, but only if I do on a larger scale. And so knowing that I can, the worst case scenario is I have to say, Oh, I made a mistake or oops, I'm sorry has allowed me to scale what I'm doing or scale my mentality about what I'm doing. Right. You're not as you're not afraid of making mistakes. So you're not trying to be perfect or like you said, do it right for this boss, or another company, et cetera. Or being told no. Or being like, told no. Right. I my entire career, I have, you know, I'm an overachiever. Like I was a triple major in college. Like I was teacher's pet. Like <laughs> I, can, I can definitely admit to that. Um, and so even at hired and, you know, I would try to do things within diversity and inclusion and ultimately like get told no or stop or this isn't your job description. And I'd be like, but this is better for humanity. This is better for our company. This is better for our branding. But I was still told no. And I don't take well to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, somebody tells me no, I get like, I get very bullish. And I say, well, that's not it. That's not a viable answer to me. Like an explanation of no, potentially, but just the flat out, like a true explanation, like not a BS explanation. Um, and so the entrepreneurship, the having, you know, a true partnership, I can go to Jess and I can say, you know, I, I screwed this one up or we screwed this one up or this isn't working. Um, how do we do it better? And truly that's where it, it becomes a conversation like this. This didn't work out well. Cool. Let's learn from it and move on. And like, let's do that on hyperspeed rather than taking six months to figure that out. Right. Now tell us what the Rise Journey is and how you work with other organizations or support other organizations through the company. Yeah. So the Rise Journey, we work with growth stage companies. So whether you're a startup and you just got, you know, your first round of funding or you're a slightly larger company and you're really looking to solidify your culture, your people, your values. Um, we believe that every company has the ability to have a great culture, to focus on diversity and inclusion, to, you know, perpetuate their values and their mission throughout their people ops, but also not sacrifice financial success to do that. Um, so we want to 
you know, our, what we do is we work with, we work with companies to help build out their foundational culture uh, so that, you know, as they grow, they face challenges rather than resets. Um, so oftentimes, and, you know, we, we use the example, it's not the best one, but, you know, weapons of Uber had had a conversation about, you know, sexism or culture or diversity mm-hmm. when they were 10 people, right. just a conversation like weapons. If that had been an open possibility at 10 people, what would, ha- what would be the conversation today? Um, you know, and it starts small, but ultimately, you know, founders and early stage companies, you know, they need to found, they need to be doing what they're doing, but HR and people ops gets, gets ignored until it's too late. And we want to be there until, you know, beforehand, before it's too late. Um, and we want to help, you know, build and grow and iterate on culture and things. And every company is different. There's all sorts of different approaches. It's not, you know, we don't work, we don't want to work with a company for six months and have things be the same because then we failed. We want to swim in a lane parallel to you and support you, you know, with all your people ops endeavors around culture and diversity and inclusion and, you know, getting the best talent and having them stay. So that way you're a, you know, functional and very profitable organization. Now, to what extent do you work with the organizations? Do you put in um, process and, and onboarding procedures and things like that, a guides for, you know, HR? Are you more so overall um, helping them kind of shape what their company culture and those kinds of things are going to be or both? Yeah. So we start with the foundation. Ideally, it's, you know, ensuring if they if they do have mission and values already in place, but if not, developing out mission and values. And it's actually a complicated mental process, but a really simple action process. Mm -hmm. Um, So we want to make sure that any company we work with has those in place. So that way we can use that as our foundation of what we do. Um, Ideally, we want to be more involved in terms of the actual putting things in place and working with the powers that are in charge and say, okay, like you. So for example, um, there's this great company divergent who's in an accelerator right now. And the founder, his brother has autism. Um, And so he wanted to, you know, find a career that his brother could do, but also that was fulfilling. And so he started a business divergent that works with e-commerce and a lot of data related things that need human touch, but are very repetitive tasks. Um, And he employs a hundred percent people with autism. Um, And it was like, are we talking about it? I was like, wow, that's great. Like, you know, you're, you're serving an underserved community. You are, your goal is to make money because you know, whatever, but you're also doing job training. And so like, if those are like in the realm of your mission and values is, you know, provide job training to an underserved community, um, create jobs for an underserved community and make a lot of money. Like those can be, you know, in your realm of mission and values. And knowing that building out your interview process, building out your professional development process, building out other pieces of what you do are always going to go back to those first three things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so whether it's a conceptual conversation, um, which we're open to having, but in reality, we want to help you put in place steps that are going to really make it not only so you understand how it's built, so you can continue building it or continue growing it, but you understand the rationale behind it and you can see the results of these steps really quickly. You know, if you're hiring people, putting in an interview process, you're going to see the fruits of that labor really fast. You know, if you put in a professional development piece, you know, and put some money behind it for your employees, you know, we want to make it that they're not, you're not just giving them money, but then they're, they're coming back and reporting on it. And they're essentially doing, you know, maybe a school the equivalent of a school report. They're coming back to their team and saying what they learned, you know, so they're encouraging their other peers to do professional development. And then all of a sudden you, you, you're fostering a culture of learning and sharing within your organization. You know, maybe you want to hire more diversely, you know, not only going to talk about how you can find more diverse talent, but you know, how you truly discover it from an interview standpoint, you know, what should you be asking and learning differently? Like, how are you, you know, what questions need to be changed or how you ask them need to be changed so that they're more diverse friendly. Cause a lot of times it's just doing these little tweaks that end up having a tremendous, you know, outcome. Um, But you need an outside eye for that. You know, you know, not everybody, you know, not everybody is a generalist in this realm. And that's, I think, a really hard thing for people to admit is, oh, I'm a founder, I'm doing these things. And it's like, that's great. But like, let us do our area of expertise so you can do your area of expertise. Right. And it's so I've worked with startups too, just from a a communication standpoint of um, some of the things that you mentioned, actually, like, how are you going to communicate within your company? How are you communicating about your brand externally? How are you doing some of these things that, uh, and understandably, understandably, excuse me, sometimes founders don't think about that because they're so focused on the product or they're so focused on the service and then they start growing, growing, growing. The company's getting bigger and all these other things that need to be in place. They have either 
no idea how to do it, no time how to do it, et cetera. So for anyone out there listening who is in that sort of early stage, these are some of the things that Jess is talking about that you can be thinking about and you can bring in outside people to do. That's the thing. You don't have to do it all yourself. In fact, you probably shouldn't try to do it all yourself, right? Like you said, you have there are people out there who have specialties or expertise in certain areas, but do it before you're the huge company or even even if not huge, just before you start bringing in all these other people, there are some things that will help you in the long run to have in place. Well, and you talk about scalability with, you know, and that everybody talks about scalability. It's like, okay, so you can try to create this process yourself as a founder and take 40 or 50 hours. You know, what is your time? What is the value of your time? If your time is valued at $100 an hour, you know, 40 hours is a lot of time Mm -hmm. versus if you hire an outside organization who focuses on this and can do it in five hours, you know, how much money are you saving? Like what kind of scale, like what can you do in those 40 hours if somebody else is doing it in those five hours, you know? And I think it's, it's always hard to see an organ, you know, as an, as having been in a found up, you know, spending money is tough. You never want to see money go out of the bank, but you know, you look at, you know, talking about diversity, you know, it's been proved every which way that more diverse teams and boards and companies make more money, you know, really basic example, um, PepsiCo, back in wherever, the early 90s, mid 90s, um, wanted to market more to a Latino community, Latinx community. And so they went to their, you know, Latino, whatever their Latino ERG groups were and said, okay, we want to task you on this project. We want your input. We want to know how to sell to your communities and ended up creating a multi-million dollar sales thing, like sales product based on the feedback from these communities that got to participate in it. And it's like, okay, you know, all of a sudden you're making more money. So, you know, if you have a product, you know, you don't want to just cater to one genre of person. If it can, you know, why would you want to sell to one person if you can sell to 10 people? And that's around diversity. That's, you know, that's diversity of customer. Um, So there's also so many ways you can think about diversity and inclusion and culture. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not just about, you know, do I have one black person, white person, one Muslim person, whatever on my team, you know, you know, who are you selling to? Who is buying from you? Who are your vendors? Like are all of those diverse? And again, these are things that you shouldn't have, you should be thinking about, but you shouldn't have to necessarily implement on your own. Right. Now, one of the workshops that you lead is on combating imposter syndrome. So I wanted to hear from you, your um, definition of imposter syndrome and why this is especially troublesome for women. I believe I read that in some information. I was doing some research on you. Yeah. Imposter syndrome is the belief that you're faking it. Um, for example, anytime I go to speak on something, I'm like, wow, I have no area of expertise. I have no knowledge. I'm just some, you know, whatever girl who's been doing startup stuff. Like, what do I actually have to say that means anything? But when I actually go back and look at my, what I have to say and what my, you know, feedback I've gotten from other people about what I have to say about things, you know, I can sound intelligent and have some, <laughs> some sense of something to say. Um, but whenever I get in that mode, I'm like, oh crap, like I'm, I'm an imposter. Like nobody should be listening to me, like whatever. Um, and that happens to everybody, you know, it happens to men, women, whomever, but women have, you know, you know, sexism and misogyny and all of that. I mean, obviously has played into the imposter syndrome piece, but also I think, and I'm going to make some assumptions here. So please, you know, grain of salt with all of this, that, you know, women on an overall scale, you know, tend to have a more emotional capacity. And because of that, we're taking in and giving out more on the emotional piece. Um, And, you know, we take it to heart a little bit more and whatnot. And so it's easy to say, well, this person has sounds so much better than me, or this person knows so much more. Like, why am I sitting on the same, you know, why am I on the same stage as this person? Or how how am I supposed to compete rather than saying, you know, this is a shared space. Um, And for a a straight fact, every, every woman I have talked to has... Once I, you know, if we have a conversation about imposter syndrome, or even if we don't, it has come across that they've had imposter syndrome at least one time in their life. And more often than not, many, many times. And it's a fleeting thing. It's not an overall thing. And I think people can get really caught up in that. I don't feel like an imposter all the time, but I have moments or flashes. It's that's just like, oh crap. And then I'm like, okay, I can take a deep breath. I can have a sip of my coffee. And then, you know, it has passed. Um, but that's also something that I've practiced is how to like let the wave rush over you and then know it's a wave and not a state of being. 
Right. So what are three actionable steps? You mentioned a couple there that you, you use tactics that you use. What are some um, actionable steps that we can take as women, as women entrepreneurs or just women stepping into whatever the quote unquote spotlight looks like? What can we do to minimize imposter syndrome, even if not completely get over it? Because people at all levels have it, right? It's not yeah. just those starting out, et cetera. So what are some things that you help people do through your workshop or otherwise? Well, and I think just really quickly before that, I think that there's an element of imposter syndrome that's really important to remember for everybody, and that's humility um, and hubris. And that, you know, it's good to have those moments of, you know, I am not the king of the world or queen of the world. You know, I'm, I'm not the Zuckerberg, and I'm sure Zuckerberg even has imposter syndrome on occasion. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's important to have that element of, you know, the world is not just me. I am not the sun. And with that, there's an element of imposter syndrome that brings that in. Um, I think there's a lot of other negative pieces, but kind of just, I think, you know, with anything, ego always gets in the way. And so it helps, you know, minimize the ego from time to time. Not that we need it as women all the time, but um, so three things that you can do to combat imposter syndrome. Um, The first one is affirmations. Um, It sounds a little, it can sound a little hokey, but I'm a big believer in affirmations and, you know, Many times in my life, I have stood in front of the mirror and looked myself in the eye and repeated the same statement three or four times until I settle down, whether it's emotionally settled down or it sits in a little bit. Um, You know, I suggest, you know, write it on a sticky note and put it in your bathroom mirror or, you know, put it on a train and, you know, you say it before you go into a meeting or whatever your mantra is, Um, you know, find your affirmations, which could be as simple as I know what I'm talking about. I, I can talk about diversity and inclusion with authority. I deserve to be on this podcast. Whatever it may be, you know, give yourself that affirmation. It sort of grounds you, especially before, like you said, a meeting or a conversation, an appearance or whatever that is. Yep. Um, and even, you know, to cite my recent example, Serena Williams and her getting completely shafted at, what was it, the U.S. Open that just the happened. The U.S. Open, yep. Um, even her, I mean, it was, this is not in an affirmation sense, but her repeating of, I am not a cheater. That is not part of my, you know, that is not who I am. I am a mother and I support it. Like there's, I mean, there's an aff- there's multiple affirmations in everything she just said. And she said it in a time of stress, um, an extreme stress. I can't even imagine she, you know, handled it so well. Um, I would have stomped off the court, frankly, but like there's affirmations in that. And, you know, I'm sure, once she calms down, if she can, she, she doesn't need to say that because she knows that. So she can say the affirmation to somebody else in that case. Um, but there's power in that. There's power in knowing where you are and where you're rooted, even if it's for that moment. So that's, I think, the, the biggest thing is affirmations. That's a great example, too, because even before the Serena Williams example, I think, you know, she may not have had to say, I'm not a cheater in those exact words before then. But just as you said, the word rooted really stuck with me of her being really grounded in the fact that I am not a cheater. I know who I am. I'm sure she says other affirmations, you know, positive affirming things. Well, that's what affirmations are, but affirming <laughs> things for herself. Um, and you, even you sometimes hear her on the court talking to herself like, come on, Serena, you know, that's yep. her thing so for everyone listening just to even get yourself as Jess said putting a note on the mirror or doing those affirmations before you go out for your day I do them too before yep. you go out for your day or before you go into the big things or even not even don't even just wait for the big things just to have it be a, a part of you so that when you are confronted with the situation where someone tries to say or take you out of who you know you really are you can go back to that and say I would rather, I think she said, I would rather lose than to cheat. Like be mm-hmm. really clear. I know who I am. You're not going to tell me, you know, that I'm this other thing. So I think that's a great example. Yeah. So the second thing I'd say with imposter syndrome is talk about it. Um, you know, you can't, you know, you're never kind of having those tough, tough conversations. You're never going to get over it or move past anything unless you have a conversation about it. And that's why the Me Too movement has been so big and time's up is because we're actually talking about it and having a conversation about it. And it's the only way to equalize and also realize how small, you know, imposter syndrome is that little, that little evil voice on your shoulder in the back of your head or whatnot. And like the only way to drown that out is to have real conversations with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. And I think that that's also a piece that I like, along with like the financial piece of being an entrepreneur, like, Imposter syndrome, it's scary. And we don't acknowledge fear enough. And until you acknowledge fear, which is part of imposter syndrome, you're never going to move beyond it. Um, So, you know, asking somebody, you know, I feel like this, 
it's, I, I, it scares me to feel like this. Have you ever felt that way? And to open yourself and be that vulnerable is so tough. But the bridges you form and the barriers you break down are incredible. Anytime I've done this workshop, like you leave the room and it's like nothing is impossible in that room after that workshop because so many barriers have been broken down. And there's, you know, with women, there's always tears. With men, there's always tears too. But so many things have been broken down and, you know, you can finally get the crack and you can let a little sunlight in if it's been that deep, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But having a conversation is step two. It, you know, have that affirmation, talk to yourself about it, and then talk with others. Right. Um, and then how it, and part of this workshop that I do is, is an affirmation breakdown and a win breakdown. So how do you build an affirmation that may be on the standard, you know, piece of it? Um, but how do you break down your wins? How do you actually see the wins for a quantitative versus a qualitative? Um, I think, I know that I often dismiss my wins as, oh, I'm really good at that. And that comes naturally to me. So that's not really a win because I can do that in my sleep. But in reality, it's a really, it's a win. Um, And so really one acknowledging the win. And I think it's like kind of the thing where women always joke, they're like, oh, I love your top. And it's like, oh, I got it for so cheap. It's like, rather than acknowledging that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Rather than acknowledging the compliment and like, owning that win of a compliment in that, like, you know, making it real simple, you have to deflect it somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, That's an insecurity thing. Yes. And we all do it. And like, also, I think we're all really proud of the deals we get in in that case. (laughs) There's always that. But you know, it's a deflection method and it's because we, it's so hard to internalize our own wins and our own value. It's it's the more so with imposter syndrome, but you know, every day, you know, and every little thing. Um, That's something that I saw that you spoke about too. I was going to ask you about um, yeah. internalizing your accomplishments. Yeah. And what that means. So that's exactly the example that you used. Yeah. And how do you, and it's little, it can be a little thing. And I say the smaller the win, the better. I hate big wins because there's no such thing as a big win. The big win is made up of a million little wins. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. did you, you know, do your 60 seconds of planks today. Did you, you know, I'm working, you know, I'm an artist and I actually recently got back into some sewing projects and like my goal today is to sew for an hour. (laughs) And that would be, if I could sew for 20 minutes, that would be a win. Even if I don't get to that hour, you know, what are the little wins that you can make work? What are a little bit every day? Um, Actually, I recently saw Molly Bloom speak and she is the movie Molly's game is based off of her story of creating this world famous poker game mm. or multiple games and one of the things she's talking about in her current stage of life is you know practicing doing something small every, like every day so she was like I wanted to start writing this book and how I started is I told myself I'm going to write for one minute today and I, every day that week she wrote for one minute and the next week she wrote every day for five minutes and then for 15 minutes so starting with those little wins and acknowledging that it's a win um, I, I love, love starting with one minute oh my gosh yeah. Which like, can, if you imagine, you're like, oh, one minute, whatever. But if like, you can do that every day, if you can start building that mm-hmm. habit, if you can start building that mentality. Right. And it all plays together. Um, but by then, but taking that ownership of, you know, the affirmation, I can do one minute of planks today. I am, I, my body is physically able to do this. You know, two, I'm going to tell somebody that I'm going to do a minute's of, minute worth of planks today. And then three, doing it and counting it as a win. Yep. Um, I love lists. I, I will write lists purely just to cross things off of them. I will write down every little chore I have to do. Even if like, I will say mop the living room, mop the kitchen, mop, whatever, just so I can cross all of them off. Um, you know, whatever it is you can do to recognize your, your, you know, validate your win, do it. You know, nobody's ever going to look at that list. I'm the only one looking at the list and nobody else is going to know unless I talk about it. So like, however you go about it, you know, is personal, but the acknowledgement of the win is not. Like that needs to be a standard. Yeah, this is so great. And I guess, well, here's the thing, Jess, I always talk about selfish questions. I don't have a selfish question for you, but a selfish share, because sometimes I ask yeah, questions just please. myself. But, um, but it's interesting. This is, I didn't have the language for this, but internalize the accomplishment. So I work with the coach, Margot Geller, who I talk about often on the podcast. And we just had a conversation about me starting to write down like you said, whatever the small wins are doing a day, or I get an email from someone who says they love the podcast, or, you know, I wrote for however much, whatever it is, writing down and remembering some of those things. So when other things happen, which other things inevitably do, things that aren't so great, or that might shift your day in another kind of way, you have something there to balance it, because it's so easy to forget 
the accomplishments, the small wins, even the big wins sometimes I have to be reminded of, oh yeah, well, I did do such and such and so and so, but I'm so focused on, you know, the things that aren't going right or things to quote unquote fix because these other things are, they're going right. I don't worry about them, but internalize the accomplishment is something that I wasn't doing, I don't think. And hearing you say about writing it and crossing it off your list triggered for me the idea of writing something down and keep and just I just keep them in my phone whatever yep. it is I don't say oh that's just a little thing nope I just keep well, it and there, in there. There's, there's some great apps and I of course I suck oh. at memorizing things like this there's some great apps and I can actually follow up with you uh, my friend Hillary uses it oh, where yeah. she writes things down and she checks it off and it'll tell you like that week how many things were added how many things you checked off so you can actually keep track and like I'm a very data driven person so I love seeing numbers I love seeing charts like I look at my LinkedIn to see who's looked at my LinkedIn profile I love like playing right. myself <laughs> Of making more and more. Um, and that's a really great way, you know, finding an app that works for you. Um, nice. We at Rise, we use, we just use a standard Google Excel document and we have like the category, the priority, who owns it, what the item is and notes on it. And then every week, and then if we finish it, we highlight it in green. Mm-hmm. And then every week we start a new tab. So it keeps all the comments and everything. And then we delete all the green things so that we can actually look back and see what we've progressed. So like from a business standpoint, it's always good. Like if we need to search something or see if somebody actually did something or whatever. Um, But, and then we start fresh every week. So we have a new list every week, but it's based off of our old list. Um, So like if we were to digital, make that digital, like it would be very, like, I think there's, I think Asana is a great one. And I'm pretty sure they have a free version um, where you can keep track of things. I'm pretty sure that Trello has some element of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're in a business, even if it's small, there's a lot of options, but as a personal thing, like, yeah, whether it's in a notebook. um, Oh, what's there's a, Oh, there's a great product called five minute journal, like five minute a day journal. Yep. That's what I write it down in. Yep. Yep. And I need to get back into that because it was so helpful. And just like, again, having that, like having that format. So you do it the same way every day. Like once Mm -hmm. you figure out your format, but Yeah. And then being able to see it like today, even if I did chores, I accomplished something today, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I think it's just really, really key to, you know, value your wins, internalize them and recognize them. Excellent. Yes. And everyone, I will make sure I have links to all of these resources, but that's, that's great. Excellent. So in closing, Jess, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person, whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Oh, man. Um, The mix of my mom and my grandma. um, I was, I am, I hate the term blessed. I hate using it, but I was so blessed to be born to strong, outspoken, not satisfied with the status quo kind of women. Um, My grandmother was accepted into who's 95, still, still kicking it, still dating, still doing all the fun stuff. Yes, um, grandma, I love it. Right. Um, was accepted to Syracuse's engineering program. And when they found out she was a woman, they said no. Um, and she went into industrial design instead because they were like, well, you can do art, but you can't actually do the design and building of things. Um, she created the largest upward bound program in all of the U S in New York and based out of Hofstra. Um, and still to this day, if you talk about upward bound, her name is renowned. Um, she, she actually, it's a little strange, but amazing. Um, when she used to take the young girls from the inner city to upward bound up upstate, she would get an IUD put in every single year to show them that it was safe to get an IUD put in because wow. she wanted to help prevent teen pregnancy in these girls. Cause she knew that if she could get them through high school, potentially into college, that they could t- make something of themselves. But if they got knocked up, it was going to be very difficult. And so she got an IUD taken in and out every summer to show Oof. them. So like, the fact that, and, and she raised three kids and like became an accomplished painter after she retired and all these other things. But like, it was just never like, I mean, she was born long before her time. Um, like before, like if she had been born today, like she would have been hanging out with Hillary Clinton and Serena and, you know, doing all the big stuff. I have no doubt of that, that like, um, so I, you know, and I am the youngest grandchild and I got to spend a lot of time with her and I am her mini me. Like it's, kind of ridiculous how similar we are in in a lot of ways. Um, And so I I got that. And then my mom, you know, is also very similar, but in a totally different way. She's much more of the introvert. She's much quieter. She um, was a single mom, was a college professor of nutrition for 25 years, got her PhD, you know, put herself through grad school through um, candlelight while she was with my father. 
um, or she would trudge a car battery up a mile long hill so that she could use that to light the lamps to study for her master's. Mm. Um, she created, you know, she was a pioneer for nutrition and wellness and, and health before people were doing that. Um, she started her own practice, you know, she went into schools and did a lot with education. She took sabbaticals and brought me, you know, to, I lived in Grenada for a while and, you know, got the experience of being the only white family on the island um, and learned about what, it, what poverty really means and what, you know, humility and, you know, privilege really means at a very young age. Um, you know, she instilled the values in me that I just, you know, will never lose. And that made me successful today. Um, and as she, she always has this story that she tells me that she, later in life, so she, after she'd been teaching for a while, she went in and saw one of my grandmother's art classes. And after the art class, she was furious with my grandmother and she couldn't figure out why. Like, but she was just furious. Like for something my grandmother did in this class just infuriated her. And she realized that she was like, my mom stole all my teaching moves. And, and she was like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. But how would my grandmother, my grandmother had never seen my mom teach or anything like that. And she realized that through osmosis, she had picked up my, all of my grandmother's teaching moves and used uh. those, and those helped her become successful. And I, and I joke with her now, I'm like, you're going to, you're going to see me and you're going to say, oh, she stole all my moves at least. Right. But like, this is a natural thing. And I see it all the time. Like what my mom does that I do. And my grandmother does that I do a hundred percent. You know, and so some of it is, a lot of it is nature, but a lot of it is nurture. Um, so, you know, thank you. I, 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 I want to, I will be getting a quote from each of them tattooed on my body. I want their, you know, handwriting forever with me. Um, you know, my, my mom, my grandmother has taught me to fight and my mom has taught me how to do it smart. Um, and, you know, one without the other is not helpful. Um, but the combination of the two is deadly in a very positive way. So just <laughs> like, a, I mean, they know how I feel about them. They, I, we're, we're all lovey-dovey and crap. And I, uh, we're all very good. Actually, grandma called me yesterday to wish me a happy, happy Jewish new year. Um, and like the oh, fact that she still does that kind of stuff. is just like so sweet. Uh, yes. Oh my goodness. I love it. That's beautiful. I'm close yeah. to my mom too. My grandma is long gone, but very close to my mom. And it's funny, as you get older, you really start recognizing, okay, I do the exact same thing. Okay. Now I know where I get it from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, now, and, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no you go. I was just going to say like my grandmother, my senior year of college, I actually a little off track, but got her, um, I went to my art professor because I was a studio art major. And I said, Steve, um, my grandma's a painter. And he was like, okay, yeah, sure. Your grandmother's a painter as is like everybody else's grandma, whatever. And I was like, no, no, no. Like you should do a show here. She does figure work. She does a lot of nude figures. Um, and he was like, okay, whatever. Like have her send me some slides. And so I, I said, grandma, send me up some slides. And she sent me like this manila envelope, like stuffed to the gills. <laughs> and I was like, hey, Steve, here's this from my grandmother. And I handed it to him and he looked at it and he looked just like so confused. Like what is this? And he was, I was like, you asked for slides for my grandmother. And he pulled out a slide and he looked, looked it up at the light. And he was like, shit, your grandmother's an artist. And I was like, Steve, I told you she was an artist. Like, how do you think I got it? And like, and we both just laughed. Cause it was just like, my grandmother was like, I want an art show at your college. Tell Steve that I'm an artist and I want an art show at your college. And, you know, I think that was probably spring of my junior year and fall of my senior year. She had the first show and she had 25 figurative paintings um, and we actually hadn't had a figurative artist display at the gallery the entire time I was at school. And so it was a very, I think we had 150 people at the reception. The president of wow. the college came out. Well, of course, my grandmother sidled right up to the president of the college and was like besties with her by the end of the night. Um, she got an article in like two of the local newspapers. Like, it's just like my grandmother sees what she wants and does it and makes it happen. And it's not a matter of it doesn't exist or it's not possible. It's like, no, tell your professor I want to show it his thing and this is how it's going to happen. And like... Well, What's All your scales. grandmother's name? We have Rowena, Rowena Smith. Ro Rowena. Rowena uh, Smith. Rowena Smith. She's a fa she's a well was a well known watercolor artist. She painted watercolors for thirty years, and within that community, she's um, got some decent acclaim and awards. Um, unfortunately, arthritis has taken the best of her. But then she started collaging her work. Um, but around my apartment in like here in New York, I have I have tons of art on the wall, and I would say more than two thirds of it is hers. I, like, I just can't it. even help Hi, it. Rowena. Like, yeah. We well, if you're it. ever, if you're, anybody's ever in Fort Lauderdale, if they ever want to stop by, she will feed anybody for all the reasons. <laughs> she, will stay, she will feed anybody. I love it. Now tell us the ways that we can support you. I'll have um, links, of course, to the website, but anything you want people to know, social media, all that good stuff. 
Yeah, me personally, you can follow me on social media, J-E-S-1-S Osro. Um, Josro is usually my form. My, my personal business is Josro Consulting. Um, but if you have a small business, if you have a startup, if you want to have a conversation about culture, about diversity, inclusion, about how to build those out, whether or not you want to be a client or not, reach out to Jess at therisejourney.com. Uh, Jess with one S again. And, you know, ultimately that's where it starts, kind of like with imposter syndrome. The first step was me saying, okay, I can do this. Second step was me, you know, creating it and talking about it with others, which was, you know, starting the rise journey. And now it's about having those conversations. Um, and nothing makes me happier than to have a conversation about diversity and diversity and inclusion and culture and equity and, you know, all of those things, you know, regardless of the opinion of the person having other on the other side of the conversation or, you know, multiple people, um, you know, I love not, I love having a conversation and not coming to a consensus at the end. I think that's the best kind of conversation. Um, because you know, that something real has been talked about. And, and that's the goal with the Rise Journey. Or another conversation. Or, yeah, or another conversation. Um, we have events we'll be hosting. We have webinars we'll be hosting. Um, if you work for a big organization and want to have me come in and talk to your you know, ERG groups or a portion of your team, um, we go in and we do conferences if you want to talk about combating imposter syndrome. Or um, I do a lot of work in the realm of invisible disabilities. Um, you know, I just want to be out there. Um, I'm actually just got the invite and confirmed I'll be speaking at Tech Inclusion San Francisco in October. Nice. So if you're in the San Francisco community, come on out. I'll be speaking about a panel uh, with the CUNY school system in New York on disability in tech and entrepreneurship. And that's on October 4th. So come on out for that. What's it um, called? Tech Inclusion? Tech Inclusion San Francisco. Um, okay. I'll make and sure then, I link to it so everybody can. Uh, yeah, and I can send you that. And then okay. um, I have the link, I believe, for the invite for the the CUNY school talk on disability and entrepreneurship and career and specifically like, you know, if you are disabled or, you know, work in the realm and, you know, you can have a powerful career just like everybody else. And I can tell you mm -hmm. how to start that or work with you on how to start that. Excellent. Jess, thank you so much for sharing your story. And then, of course, this insider look at uh, or in, insight, I should say, of um, imposter syndrome. We hear people talk about it a lot, but I, I know for me, really looking at internalizing accomplishment is going to be a big help. And I think it will for a lot of people listening too. So thank you. No, thank you. And keep me posted and let me know if I can help you in any way as well. Absolutely. And I will look forward to hearing from you about moving to Valencia. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Have a good rest of your day you or too. night. <laughs> but before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Uh, no is just an alternative to find another path. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jess. To find out more about her, to find out more about what she's up to, her workshops, and all that great stuff, just make sure that you go to supportissexy.com. Go to that search icon and just type in Jess, J-E-S. Her show notes page will pop up with links and resources, all the ways to get in touch with her. Supportissexy.com and just search Jess. Thank you so much for being here. Again, I hope you know just how much I appreciate you. It honestly would not be the same without you. And if you are a new podcast listener to Support is Sexy, thank you so much for checking it out. I hope that you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We have a lot of great women coming up, a lot of great content coming up, a lot of great things that I'm up to that I'd love to share with you. So make sure you subscribe. All right, so thank you again for being here. And until we chat again, always remember, support is sexy and having it all doesn't mean doing it all alone. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.